Hello everyone, welcome to Vassals of King's Grave. This is the 16th part of our linear uh, Ice, Song of Ice and Fire reread series. Today we will be covering the first 10 days or so of February 299, which covers the Clash of Kings prologue, Aria 2, Bran 1, Sansa 1, and Tyrion 1. My name is Greg, I, I will be hosting today, and my name is Claudius the Fool on the forums, and I'm joined by six other vassals today. Hi, I'm Adam, also known as Drowned Snow on the forum. Hi, I'm Jack. Also known as It Rhymes with Sleek on the forum. Greetings, mortals. This is Patrick. Patrick the Tolls on the forums. <laughs> Hi, this is Casey, Blue-Eyed Queen on the forums. This is Matt, Varley on the forums. This is Jeff, Jeff14 on the forums. All right. That wasn't so hard, was it? Patrick's like, hello, peasants. <laughs> Peons. <laughs> He's the only one here from the old country. So I, although we did get into a little bit of Clash of Kings in the last one, this is the first book where I, the first recording where all the chapters are from Clash of Kings, right? Show is no, there was no Clash of Ki Clash of Kings last time. It was the time before that. I think we had a chapter, right? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't listen to the episodes that I don't have, so I wouldn't. Know. <laughs> I know. I know what you're saying. I, I, mean. I, was, I was trying to avoid calling that out, but yeah. <laughs> but all right, so we might have a little Game of Thrones TV show talk in the after show but we're not going to do that now so we don't want to lose any listeners or attendees so how about we get right down to the clash of kings prologue summary which is patrick this whole prologue is about maester crescent and his efforts to try to to save some of his influence over uh stannis essentially he remembers to begin with uh, his first arrival at Dragonstone looks over the uh, the sea and and sees the comet and and wonders if he is if it is a, an omen as his as he can feel that it might be. Patchface and Shireen comes and uh, wants to to see the the White Raven, which apparently means that autumn is on his way and winter is coming. Patchface is creepy again. Uh, is creepy for the first time and talks about merfolk and and ninimones. I like the word ninimone. Anemone. Ninimone is not a sea and then an anemone. 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 It's a okay. cotton-headed ninimone. Enemies from the sea. <laughs> many many an enemies. Uh, but no no it's a, a ninimone apparently and it looks like a purplish uh, flower some sort. Yeah, they wear, wear ninimones in hair and some sort of silver as dresses, so that's cool. Yeah, so after that, Crescent goes up to talk to talk to Stannis, and on his way he meets uh, Lord, uh, Sir Davos, not Lord Davos any, uh, yet. Lord Davos has been sent to meet with the great lords. He's met with Gillian Swan, Lord Selwyn Tarth, and uh, Lord Penrose. None of them have, have uh, joined Stannis in, in the fight because they've, most of them have already gone to Renly. That's not good news, and Davos knows it, but he will not lie to his king, which is cool. When Crescent then arrives and talks to Stannis, he tries to um, persuade Stannis to broker a, an alliance between him and Lysa with a marriage between Rob, Robert and... Uh, Shireen, it doesn't seem like the Red Woman wants that to happen, so why is that, I ask. He concocts a plan to murder her, and while he, when he arrives to the, to the dinner hall in the Great Hall, the feast has already commenced. He is slighted once more, with Pylos being in his seat, and, and Stan is telling him that that Pylos will will uh, substitute him from now on. So Crescent takes a seat by Sir Davos, who is uh, on the place along with uh, King, uh, King Stannis, Queen Selyse, Pylos, Melisandre, uh, Lord Adrian, Lord Durham, Lord Gunster, Lord Mumford, uh, and Salador San. 
So Davos tells Crescent that Stannis has chosen to, tu- uh, to trust Melisandre's visions and presses claim. Crescent tries once more to sway Stannis towards not going into war because uh, 3,000 men on Dragonstone isn't necessarily enough to win battles when both Rob and, and Tywin has uh, hosts of 20,000 or more. So... Um, uh, but yeah, uh, Stannis cannot be swayed, and then Crescent tries to uh, to do the old bait and switch thing. I mean, uh, yeah, tries to drop some uh, poison into his, to Melisandre's drink. She does like a Venetian thing where she, she where he has to drink with her for her to drink it. Seems like the gem on her throat it makes her immune to poisons, and Crescent dies. So that's how it ends, and really, this is just the one of the best prologues in the in the books, in my sense, because it has both the introduction of Stannis, introduction of Melisandre, and and Crescent is just such a likable character. I was thinking the other day about how Melisandre survived and he died, because you know I'm one of those people who believes that none of this is actually much magic; it's more practical stuff, and. I think what she did was she might have hidden some poison in, like, her teeth or under her tongue or something, taken the antidote for herself beforehand, drank all the wine, and then backwashed some of it into the cup and given it to him. I was thinking because they, uh, you know, he gives that whole thing about how the crystals actually came from Ashai, and then they went to Lys, and then, but, like, the poison itself originated in Ashai, right? And that's where she's from, and I assume she, like, did some, uh, you know, where she just, like, took very small bits of the poison and trained herself to be, you know, eventually became immune to it. Like the Uh, dreads of Pirate Roberts. Exactly. It's Iocane powder. (laughs) Yeah. What if she was able to just only see, like, the parts of the wine that was not poison and just drink that? That's the kind of idea. What? Excuse me? How do you do that? (laughs) (laughs) That's way harder. I'll have the unpoisoned part of the wine, please. (laughs) No, but like, what if she's she's magical? Well, at least I think she is, and she could be able to see like what parts poison, what parts not. But it's a it's dissolved into liquid. That'd be like ordering a mixed drink and just being able to drink the booze. Yeah, well, no, I know, but hashtag magic. <laughs> That's way harder though than just the uh, I'm immune to poison thing though. I don't know. I kind of yeah. like the selective drinking theory. <laughs> Were you saying that maybe she left all the poison in the cup? Because yeah. obviously Crescent got the poison part of it. So she could like drink Kool Aid and leave all the crystals in the cup. Just drink all the water. Yeah. And then she can rule Jonestown all by herself. So do you don't think that the ruby shimmering redly uh, has any meaning specifically to the uh, her being able to survive the uh, the poisoning? I yeah, know. I think it's like an indicator of her magic, because doesn't it happen again when she's doing the glamour on uh, Mance? The ruby pulses or something? But it always says it seemed to. It seemed to pulse. It seemed to... Like, I, I think that might be us reading more into it than it's actually... Like, it's he's intentionally misleading with, is it actually, like, glowing red? So, so you don't think she has any magic? I think she has the magics. I think she has minor magics to uh, make illusions. You know, she can make the right. illusion that her ruby is pulsing, but she can't, I don't think she can withstand poison by herself. Well, even in dance, she's already like, oh shit, my supplies are low, so I can't make yeah. like all the like foolish smoke and powders and shit like that that make men believe I can do shit. Right. Yeah. And this might yeah. be me being poisoned by the TV show, but <laughs> it's. I think this is purely to show when she, when she realizes that, uh, um, you know, Thoris was resurrecting uh, Barrack, oh, which yeah. is like, how are, how are you doing this? Which is, I'm pretty sure that was just in the show, but still, it's like, wait, you're not supposed to be able to do this. I can't even do this. Yeah, yeah. Never... Well, I think I think you're right in in that sense. Uh, that, she, but she does do magic. I mean, she makes the the the. I mean, it was Varamir's bird burn yeah, in the sky? That's right. There's uh, a theory about that. And she oh, there's a the with lenses. Yeah. There's okay. So she, there is things that does suggest that she can't do magic in, in some sense of another. Uh, but yeah, maybe she does just small things, but I don't think that uh, I mean, surviving poison is out of the realm of possibility, and, and like it doesn't seem that like a, a miracle. I mean, not, not like 
stories of me re- resurrecting uh, Beric and Daring in like seven times. Also, a cheap trick. You know what it is? She's got like the Lord of Light, and so she's got this fire in the back of her throat, and just burns the wine as she drinks it, so she never really ingests it. That's my theory. <laughs> okay. Let's go. We'll go with that. She can breathe fire. She's a dragon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, theory. <laughs> we learn about Patchface, and, and like, he kind of gives a nice little backstory about, like, the Baratheon boys. Like, Stannis yeah. has always been a moody little guy. Yeah. I mean that's that's also one of the things one reason why I really love this uh, this uh, chapter because it's just he he talks about Stannis like a, like a parent. On the one hand, if you just, if you didn't have his inner monologue about about how Stannis has been treated whole his his whole life, uh, you would be really I mean you you wouldn't have as much sympathy for Stannis, would you? No, because I mean without that you. There's no character at all. Like, you know, otherwise he's just a stubborn prick. Well, I always liked him just because, like, hey, he's the rightful king, and yeah, he's tough, but when you do get the actual person, you know, the more the, the sad stuff about, you know, where Crescent almost talks to him like he was his father. He said, I was, you know, when he, you were more of a son to me than, uh, I was more of a father to you than, you know, Lord Stefan was, and he talks about you were the one unloved, the one who needed me the most. Like, that's, I don't know how you don't at least understand where he's coming from. You don't have to like Stannis, but... He's he's definitely formed by uh by his by his circumstances and what he went through. All right, well, well unpopular opinion, um, but I, th- reading this chapter again, I it reminded me how I don't like Stannis all that much. I I really yeah. I understand why people like him, and but I don't understand why people love him. You mean people like right. fans or like the in the story like cause... no it's like fans. Yeah, it's more from uh, once you start. Well, for me, it was. You know, I can only speak for me. Once you started getting it from Davos's point of view, from his chapters, because I I love Davos. I mean, most people like Davos. There's very few like Davos haters out there, but there's plenty of Stannis haters, and I feel like getting it through Davos's lens um, softened Stannis a little bit, and uh, at least gave it from his point of view. And that's that's where I started because from the prologue, of course, like there's a little bit like we said about his, you know, when he was a kid and he was unloved, but he's making his his old, you know, maester dance and wear a fool hat and he's humoring his wife. He's being a dick to uh, to, to him pretty much. Mm. And yeah, uh, but no, it's definitely oh. through Davos's point of view that I uh, that I started to to warm up to Stannis. Yeah, I, um, I like him because he's one of the few people who's in charge who actually seems to give a crap about the well being of the realm as a whole. You know. He, he wants to be king, but he also wants, you know, the peop- the small folk to live and stuff like that. It's a shame because he Good. really lacks uh, personability, the ability to talk to people. <laughs> right. Like, well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I like Dr. Stan. This would be horrible with patients. <laughs> It'd be like, yeah. get over Bad it. Bad bedside manner. <laughs> like, well, yeah. you're going to die. That, does Stannis really care about what's going on in the realm? Really, really? I mean, isn't it like Davos suggesting that they might go to uh, uh, to the north, and Melisandre saying, "Oh, yeah, that's a good idea." I mean, Davos, the Stannis isn't really that keen on saving the the, the Night's Watch before. Yeah, no one, no one really knows that, that what's about to go down up there. Because I feel like he he does only. I feel like he doesn't really care that much about the people. He really cares more about. That he should be on the throne and that Joffrey shouldn't, or in later. Yeah, well, I, it's kind but of that. Right. But I I think that he doesn't care about the individual people. He doesn't necessarily want to see justice for all the poor farmers, but he wants the he wants like I want. He's like you know I want the economy to be good. I want rest restaurants to be in a good place and other people to yeah. respect us. Like he wants everyone to be doing well on a whole on a broad sense. But if there's still people being crushed in the dirt, it's like whatever. Right. Are you sure yeah, you're, also, not, you're not making this stuff up, stuff up? Because I don't think I've ever heard him saying stuff like that. Well, no, why it's would just he his, go just his to... attitude. His attitude for for the realm is kind of that he, like, th- if he thought that Renly would have been a better ruler than him, I think he might have actually backed Renly. I mean, it's it's his claim and all that, and he's a little bit you know uppity about that. But he also knows that, at least in his mind, like Renly would just run things into the ground as much as Robert did. Wow, I mean, I, I don't I think that would ever. Disagree. I mean, if maybe before Renly claimed declared himself, he had talked to Stannis. Mm-hmm. There was a small chance, maybe, but I can't. Especially from reading, you get it from Stannis. Well. No, like, that's yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Is if is if somehow you know, like Renly was just this awesome guy and like you know, just like way better than Stannis and everything. Hook, 
or like a fish yeah. at some point in their yeah. life, maybe, but he never got that, no. He could have been sure? like, hey, hey, you want uh, you want Storm's End, you know, and like, he probably could have done that, but... Are you yeah, sure? I think this is... I, I, I think, think, so. think that's. I think the situation would have gone down something like this. Uh, Renly would have said, "Hey, do you want Storm's End?" and 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 Stans would have said, "Storm's End is rightfully mine. Yes, I want it, and I want the rest of the realm because it's rightfully mine. And I I want no. To get I, what I, I get it. I'm just saying in mine. this in this current in the, in this current setup, I don't think there's any way it works. But if Renly is a different person that Stannis respects more. Like let's say Renly is more like a like a Ned, and and then we have this situation with the Lannisters on the throne, and and no one really wanting to back Stannis. I think that maybe he could have been persuaded in that way. Well, and I, I, I think don't think so. Is, no, I need, think this re- is the neither did I. I mean, I really think that that Stannis is all about the just reward for whatever you do, and and Stannis has waited his turn, and now it's time for him to be king. And that's just how it is, and that's the whole reason why he's fighting this war is because he's finally in the position yeah, to get his, what is it's his. It's his time, but they also he also recognizes that uh, Robert was never really in line for the throne. Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of I think in, in this chapter is when we hear about he just gets crapped on his whole life up to this point. You know, they they give him the bad castle, they let him starve, they don't give him any credit for what he does. So now he's looking for credit for for something. You know. His middle child. Yeah, but I, I, <laughs> yeah, I never got the fact that like Dragonstone was a step down. Like that's where like the next like king w- like was always put. Like the Prince of Dragonstone was like well, when, well, when, when they were Targaryens, from. when they were Targaryens yeah. and dragons. Once the dragons went away, I mean, even Rhaegar, like well, how how much did he really appreciate Dragonstone? And also, Storm's End, like, I think it was mentioned in the chapter, they have, like, a ton of money there, whereas Dragonstone, all the Targaryens have left, so there's no money there anymore. He has to build up the economy of that area, pretty much. Yeah. Well, and that's why it was and a good the, seat for a prince, because the prince was going to inherit the kingdom. It didn't really matter if, if right. he ever needed anything. Or, like, the, the, the king would be sitting in King's Landing and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you, here's some gold you, if you need it, like, if they were ever in trouble. But with, the reason- yeah, uh having having uh, Stannis is a bit different. The reason Dragonstone's the the keep for the prince is because it's the Targaryen ancestral keep. Yeah. So now that the Baratheon dynasty is in power, it should be Storm's End because that's their ancestral keep. Mm. It wouldn't make sense to sort of change that, but again, leaving it leaving it to Renly, did he did he leave that to Renly conditionally? Like was he like, well, eventually Tommen's going to take over Storm's End because he's my son? No, like he just sort of was like Renly you're you're it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But I also I mean, feel like all- Renly couldn't have like set up Dragonstone like Stannis did. Like Stannis is definitely more capable of saving or not saving, but like keeping Dragonstone good. Prepared. Yeah. 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 But Stannis did his means? job. He's he was sent there to root out the Targaryens to, and yeah, he didn't get Sir Darry, but he even says it here, no one could have. He was gone by the time he got there. He didn't fail on that. But a lot of his mm. bitterness does it's not so much against Renly, it's more towards Robert, it seems, where you know, he yeah. called Ned his brother. He he didn't thank St- Stannis for holding Storm's End for a year, he thanked Ned for relieving Storm's End, you know. And you but again, how old was Stannis? Like twelve, I'm trying to think. Like how old was he like holding Storm's End? Like what did well, he, he actually 34 do? Thirty four now. He was probably twenty two. Twenty three. Well that that doesn't make sense because wasn't Robert like seventeen or eighteen? No. No, no he's like twenty five at the Oh no! In the rebellion, he's like eighteen or nineteen. Okay. No, like you're in the, in the show, they're all aged up. But in well, the Preston book, says that Stannis is, has not yet reached his thirty fifth birthday here, so I assume he's like thirty four. That was this hmm. is twelve years ago, right? No, the rebellion was like 15? seven, fifteen, sixteen years ago, right? Oh no, that's in the show. It, no, because right, because Rob the rebellion. I think it's fifteen. It's fifteen years because the oh, great shocking lack of knowledge. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> We're yeah, just gonna okay. look it up then instead. Well, wasn't the rebellion two eighty one and the current year is two ninety nine or three hundred? Yeah. Okay. So. So nineteen years. Yeah. Roughly. Okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. So wow. so Stannis was pretty darn young. Yeah. yeah, but like remember, like in this place, people are young. Like Daron, whoever, like conquered, right. tried to conquer Dorne at sixteen. Sansa is, is getting married. Rob I know, but it puts, it puts it puts all of this in a, a new perspective. Like you know. 
the the onions show up and you got this 13 year old who's like good work take his hands you know take his fingers i don't want to think of that because that changes everything (laughs) it's like a joffrey almost yeah i mean well he's not doing it because he's 13 if he's 35 now and it was 19 years ago that makes him 16 well all right i'm cutting all this out and and someone will say oh well the the uh, okay it was 282 to 283 so let's call it 283 was the siege. This is 93. This is 17 years later, right? Or 16 when the war started? Yeah, because okay. that, that adds a little better. So this Reddit thing says, Reddit was, or I'm sorry, Ned was 35 at the start of um, a Game of Thrones. And if it happened 14 to 15 years ago, that would make Ned 20 to 21. Yeah. Well, we just know how, it, we just know that it was like 17 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and because cause they were all still wards and stuff, so they were all under, you know, they were, they were fairly young. I mean, by 20, man, you've got to have a castle and, like, 10 kids. and you got to get moving. <laughs> well, they do say that Renly was, like, not yet 12, right? He was still, like, a boy, like, a young boy. Mm. Um, yeah, he was, like, eight or yeah, something. Has anyone heard the audiobook of the prologue? Yeah. Yes. Where you yeah. get... Davis's awful, awful voice. <laughs> it's like, oh, in, in the black of night, my favorite time. Oh. <laughs> he goes into leprechaun mode a little bit. That's that's his range. Yep. Well, yeah, but he does do a, a very um, uh, unnerving uh, patch face, I think. Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, he does. Yeah. No one complains that the trees doesn't do a good fool. He does some great fool. <laughs> so, yeah. speaking of patch face, do you think with the shadows dancing, that's a reference to Danny, Mary Missouri, or what? No, it's it's possibly. I thought it was patch Shadow Baby. Face. Yeah, I think maybe Shadow Baby as well. I don't know. Ooh. Now, patch face. All of Patch Face's, uh, all of his things that he says is because he's half stuck between the living and the dead, and he's seeing the world of the dead. I have a theory on it. A ring in the, okay. In the craziest thought- <laughs> thread. Yeah, I can. I kind of think it's it's connected to the deep ones or the merfolk. Him being like connected to the uh, the drowned god in a sense, uh, without him willingly being as he's been unwillingly sacrificed. Because I because I also think think that there's actually some power in what uh, Aaron Dampere is doing with resurrecting the uh, or I mean drowning oh. and and then bringing them back to life. Yeah, I I in do. CPR. Yeah, the power of CPR. <laughs> well, yeah, you laugh now, but I think there is power in the in the drowned god, and I think and and CPR is really violent. Like he'd be breaking their ribs, and a lot of them wouldn't survive. But also, I mean, to Patrick's point, isn't the whole like uh, mythos behind Storm's End that like the sea god was like pissed because like yeah. you know one of the Baratheons stole their. Uh, like their daughter or something, so they kept on having to build like a stronger and stronger castle. I think it was the Storm God, but yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the Storm God is the the uh, the opponent to the Drowned God. So, uh, so I think that if if they have the same mythos there as well, I mean, there might be some connection, right? I, well, it's I, a I, it's a kind of a first man mythos, right? Yeah, I know, and I I just I just like the the connection that that. That Patchface got his prophetic powers for through getting drowned and being closer to the drowned god than even before. I mean, everything he talks about is in in connection to the sea, which yeah, he has. Right. There's a long history of associating being lost at sea with insanity, just in like history and literature. Um, and even in Moby yeah. Dick, there's a very famous passage where you know this one of the uh, cabin boys is like fetched overboard, and he literally goes insane when he comes back because he's like left in the sea for an hour with sharks circling him. And he and I always, I mean, we know we're pretty we pretty much know later on that he does have some prophetic abilities, but it doesn't mean that everything he says, you know, because as you're I'm reading, reading this, I'm like. Well, obviously that's nothing. He's just talking about something else there. But there is something. <laughs> I think that because he predicts the future a couple of times, a lot of people think that he must always be predicting the, predicting the future. But why can't he be looking into the past and seeing things too? Yeah. You know, the like, shadow stuff, You know, he mentions it three times. Obviously that means something. The thing that I theorized in my theory is that the shadows are dancing. That's like him in the world of the dead seeing that the others are raising the bodies of the dead. And that to him in the world of the dead, it looks like their shadows are are, are dancing because they're being jerked around by like another 
force moving their body. Ooh, that's thin body. <laughs> <laughs> Super creepy. It's yeah, it is pretty creepy. But yeah, poor Crescent. And I'm pretty sure that in uh, Feast for Crows, they mentioned that he had to like wipe the ass of like one of the Archmaesters, because one of the Archmaesters calls Pate Crescent. Yeah, the, the senile guy. Yeah. Do you think he did that, actually? Because uh, the Archmaester and Crescent is almost the same age, right? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Hmm. Yeah, but... I I, I'd like to imagine that he still wiped his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think he would have become an Archmaester if he was senile already at, like, 25. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that would have been a... A, a good choice for the maesters to f promote him to Archmaester. Hmm. You know, let, let me have my dreams. Okay, you're fine, <laughs> but it's just not... <laughs> Your dream is Crescent wiping his ass? Hey, <laughs> no, wiping the other guy's ass. ass. Jesus. Data connections. He's making connections. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, we also get the first mention of, of um, Lady Silice's mustache, which was uh, very important. <laughs> Like Stan, I mean that can't help having like a fugly wife, right? <laughs> <laughs> we we know from Crescent's own mouth that he only does his husbandly duty twice a year, so I don't think he worries about it. Oh. I mean, they're a perfect and, Ro person and Robert otherwise. set that marriage up, right? Yeah, and then he fucked her sister into the bed like, I mean, before I they just, did. I would love, I'd love to go back in time and figure out exactly why he set that marriage up and like what happened. You see, I'm just wondering. I'm just Probably wondering John if... Aaron had something to do with it. And Renly never was never set up. Like I don't know. I mean, we kind of know why Renly wouldn't want to be, but well, he is to Marjorie, right? Not no, but not by Robert. Robert. Why does Baratheon need stronger ties with House Florent? They're the second most powerful house, and maybe to counter the power of Highgarden, because Highgarden went for Targaryens. Okay, don't you have High Tower and Redwine as well as? just as yes. powerful as the Florence. Yeah, and I think Hightower is more antagonistic yeah. with, with the Tyrells anyways. How George wealthy are the Florence? Lockers. Pretty wealthy. Couldn't it have been something where uh, maybe John Aaron arranged it because Robert was spending the hell out of all the money? And No, oh, maybe. I don't know. Because, like, I mean, in the first book, don't they go through, like, the exchange houses, the, you know, they list, like, everyone that they borrowed money off of. Yeah, they, they say they owe money to Highgarden, so maybe they're just lumping in the Florence with that. Uh, maybe. Possibly. Yeah. I think George just wanted to make his life even worse. <laughs> so even George hates Dennis? <laughs> He's like, we'll give him an ugly wife and uh, let's deform her his only child. I mean, yeah. No, All right, let's do that. To, like, the I mean, he, aren't, they're like pretty good personality match, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, so I, it's not bad. No, it's not the worst thing. I kind of get what you're, so. what you're saying, Casey, because he is not like Mr. Congeniality, right? Yeah. He is. Uh, <laughs> he, any 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 match that have been set up between other houses, maybe more powerful houses, would probably not have gone well because of Stannis' demeanor. I mean, he's not a likable person to begin with, at least. Uh, so I guess that a lot of people, a lot of uh, ladies wouldn't have said no, no, thank you. I'm, I'm waiting for a, a much nicer. Is this, a, is this a world where ladies get to say no? That doesn't seem. Yeah, that doesn't seem what <laughs> well, we see um, well, from the book. Well, yeah, well, you watch does, Game of Thrones. Like, <laughs> yeah, unless, unless it's actually a strategic marriage, uh, they would have a say in it. At least you have like, you have always in in every generation you have like a crop of suitors and. And I don't think that's that Stannis would have been the first chosen, right? I really think that the both are there are any because like the, like the Blackfish avoids marriage, even though he's told to numerous times. Is, are there any women in the story that were just like, yeah, we we weren't able to marry her off? I'm sure there are. There's a lot yeah. of silent sisters out there, right? Brienne. Well, yeah. Oh yeah, Brienne. Well, that, yeah. But I meant that's like, but I meant like like women who they tried to marry off, and the women the women weren't into it. I mean, Brienne. No one no one said yes. To she didn't say she didn't say yes either. I know, but like yeah. she never really had a chance to say no. I mean, 
Didn't she fight one dude and like break three of his ribs and that broke off yeah. the like engagement? Yeah, and that was yeah. that was like the initial meet and greet. <laughs> she would have said right. yes to, to see if anyone was interested. I, I'd say that's a hard no. Yeah, <laughs> I, w I would take that as a rejection. I say um, Shireen has dragon dreams. Yeah, she thoughts. Does. I don't. I th I thought it was interesting because I feel like we forget that there is a Targaryen in that line, but or does it even mean anything? Does Shireen no, become a dragon rider? I don't there think is, that. There is theories about that. There is theories about uh, Shireen being like a, the stone dragon that, that rises and and her yeah. having some sort of significance either as a sacrifice or as a dragon rider in a sense. And you, I mean, in this chapter you kind of get an allusion to it. I mean, it might be this chapter that actually made the theories, but I think that Shireen... Personally, I don't think that Shireen is is that important. Uh, but but what do you guys? Yeah, think? I, I guess I've never really heard of her as a dragon rider, but I I feel like she's more prophetic than dragon wire dragon rider per se because I feel like maybe she has like some kind of connection with Ex Essos because of the grayscale, but or maybe because of her possible future. Um, but that's kind of my feelings towards it. Mm. I was just going to say the most logical explanation is that she grew up in a castle surrounded by terrifying gargoyles and dragons, and that's probably why she had bad nightmares. But that it could be that, that works. Yeah. <laughs> Even Arkham like Crescent Tracer. talks about how he's freaked out by them, and he's like eighty though. Yeah. But aren't they his friends? Don't doesn't now he call them? Now he's got names for them and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's like Carl the uh, dragon, you know. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, maybe. Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Carl? <laughs> oh, you Let's went Walking Dead. I was Carl. thinking more like Carl Pilkington. Like, oh, I'm just Carl. a dumb dragon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, but, what is it? What, what, what are you... Uh... Yeah, okay. Anyway, so a theory, right. the theory that might help a lot of people uh, in is that maybe that if she is a, the one of the he dragons, head of the dragons, and... And that, and that her and Fagon are the, actually the head of the dragons, and no, no Jon Snow and no Tyrion uh, as heads of the dragons. That might help a lot of people uh, in, in, like, not being as a lot of people hate the the fact that Jon has to be a, a head of the dragon if he's like, you know, related to the Targaryens. Right. I mean, Fagon's got way more Targaryen blood, even if he's a Blackfire, than. Shireen does, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well because yeah. who are the Blackfires marrying over the centuries over there? Like that's diluting the blood. Whereas, what uh, Shireen's great grandmother or something was a Targaryen. Yeah. Plus, they um, they, they com complete they like regularly intermarry with the Baratheons uh, to keep the I mean not to keep the bloodline pure, but but it does sort of reinforce the the. The DNA of the Barath the, the Baratheons, right? And and the original Baratheon Oris was like the bastard brother of Ares, right? Rumored to be Aegon, yeah, Aegon, Aegon. Yeah. But we know that the Baratheons were, you know, they were Targaryens. Them, the Valerians, they all came over around the same time, right? Mm. They're, they're all a Valerian stock. <clears throat> So, for all you um, R plus L equals D fans out there... Um, There's no woo! fans, there's one. There's one. There's one. Yeah. I'm, I mean, a fan. I'm, I'm not a fan. I, I'm not, I believe R plus L equals J for the most part, but um, there's a line in there that says that uh, Derry took Viserys and the babe, not being specific to Danny there. So, possibilities open. Just saying. <laughs> how, how much is Scott paying you? You can... <laughs> No, I found that on my own. <laughs> uh, all right, so we are on to Aria two, and this is—I lost my notes. Who's doing Aria two? Jack. Okay, the floor is yours. All right. So in this chapter, Aria, the traitor. You have to do it in—you have to do it in iambic pentameter. I thought I told you that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so in this chapter, Aria, the traitor on the run, adds to her criminal record. Already a hardened criminal, having assaulted the prince, abused cats, murdered a royal stable boy, and committed high treason, 
She's now a fugitive from justice, and she's taking advantage of a nonpartisan humanitarian group, the Night's Watch, to smuggle herself back into the territory of her older brother, a rebel warlord. Oh, I While see what he's travels... doing. I see what he's doing. <laughs> Very While clever. While she travels north, she witnesses thousands of, di- of displaced civilians fleeing south to the safety of the government-controlled capital. At first, it's just a trickle, but soon she's passing hundreds of desperate refugees a day. As her party gets closer to the rebel-held territory, graves begin to appear by the road, the first being a child, followed by many others. One night, as they're traveling, Arya wakes up. She is described as staying so silent that she could hear her party's breathing, and then she falls asleep with a sword in her hand. The next day, Prayed, one of the mercenaries traveling with their group, just happens to be dead. Now, is that a coincidence? And, uh, and all of his gear is given to her friends, the people who will protect her as they're traveling. I don't think that's a coincidence. And as a little aside, a boy named Tarber puts his nuts on Prade's grave and says something about wood growing. Having sufficiently <laughs> looted the You took a beautiful thing. You took a beautiful thing that Tarber did. He tried to plant acorns to make an oak grow where this man lived and made it about balls. So... <laughs> I teared up when I read that because I didn't remember that. It's <laughs> just another joke about man beasts. <laughs> Anyways, having sufficiently looted the dead man's body, the party leader decides that he now has enough money for them to bathe and eat at the local inn, presumably from raiding the guy's purse. While Arya is sitting and enjoying her alcohol, as she should, and food, a uh, conversation in the inn turns towards the war. The displaced civilians speak about the horrors of the war her brother started, and the mountain clans taking advantage of the power vacuum to gain power. And uh, Arya thinks of her grandfather, another rebel commander, but manages to stay quiet instead of supporting him openly. Uh, the conversation wait, turns. Wait, wait, to... whoa, whoa, whoa! Yeah, which grandfather? Hoster or Hoster. Rickard? Okay, Hoster. Let's know. just let Thank Grand Moff Tarkin finish his summary, and then we'll. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I'm just stating the facts. Rebel scum. Uh, <laughs> Arya thinks of her... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, conversation then turns to wolves. The villagers talk about a pack of savage wolves that's been killing all of their livestock and hunting people. This makes Arya think about her wolf, Nymeria. She wonders where Nymeria is and thinks back to when she savagely abused her pet to the point of it running away. Anyways, a man in the inn recounts a horrifying story about a wolf eating a baby in the middle of a market in plain daylight. Everyone in the inn is horrified, except Arya, who denies the man's story and comes to the defense of the savage animals. When she's removed from the premises, kindly, she decides to spend time with her own kind, the hardened criminals locked up in a cage. After several minutes of pleasant conversation with the criminals, Arya is pulled aside by her only friend, Gendry, who also happens to be on the Queen's Most Wanted list. Being the violent sociopath that she is, she immediately challenges him to a duel, both children using real military-grade weapons. Before they can murder each other, though, uh, the friendly neighborhood police officers arrive, and the two fugitives from justice hide in the bush. The officer, following all of the proper procedures, shows Yorin an official warrant for the arrest of the criminals. Warren disregards the warrants and foolishly suggests that potential recruits who haven't been sworn in yet to a nonpartisan organization should be exempt from the law. The dutiful officer, seeing that Yorin is armed and impeding a royal investigation, draws his weapon for fear of his own safety, of course. Yorin escalates the situation further by drawing his own weapon and pointing out that the officer and his deputies are outnumbered. Arya then proceeds to join the others in threatening government officials, another crime on her part, and Yorin, being the sneaky man that he is, manages to inflict a minor injury on the poor officer, which forces the officer to drop his weapon and he runs away, presumably to his family to go, you know, cherish them and stuff. Uh, Yorin gives this <coughs> military weapon to another kid, and then the party flees from justice as quickly as they can, knowing that the proper authorities will soon be following them. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> First off, can I just say how shitty this world is when you can't afford a fucking bath? Like, <laughs> I think do that water ain't cheap. I think that took no? longer than uh, than reading it. <laughs> <laughs> and this I is like why this. I stopped it's writing twisted. funny summaries. Slant on it, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well done, Jack. That was very entertaining. Yes. <clears throat> so. 
<laughs> what do you guys think about her throwing rocks at her wolf? You still think she's a good guy? <laughs> of course she's the good guy. She That's one to. of the better things she did. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, knowing what she's exactly. going to do later on, this stuff is like so this is very child's play. Her animal is the best thing she's done so far. Except, very few people when they shoo away their their animal, does it save the animal's life and then cause it to form a giant roaming pack, which just murders people up and down the, the river. And yeah, they have some murderers. Too. Murdering bad people, pretty much, right? Hey, they pull cat out of the water. Yeah, they seem to do some good stuff. Well, the wolves seem we'll to mirror their, their, their owner's emotions pretty well. Yeah. As we'll see like later yeah, on in this so. reread, but... Yeah, yeah so just br- briefly speaking of later on, do you, did you guys spend, like, four books wondering when the hell she was going to find that wolf and, like, they were going to be badass together again? Yes. Uh, oh, dude, I... Happen. Seven or eight books, maybe book nine, we don't know, it'll happen, don't worry. <laughs> I, need, I need her, like, riding on Nymeria being, like, a horrible murderer... She, like, she, meets, she, meets Nime- she meets Nymeria and now it talks to her. I've been gone yeah. for so long. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've gained sentience. Yeah. <laughs> but to be fair to Arya, if Santa never lied, then Arya wouldn't have to send the wolf away. See, it's always Santa's fault. Yeah, everything's Santa's fault. Mm. But That's to come fair. down on the side of Arya well. not being a psychopath, she does have the line here how she didn't even want to kill the fleas in her clothes because she would have been cruel to drown them in a bath. So she does love some animals. <laughs> Yeah, fleas, <laughs> fleas. Yeah. Meanwhile, she's I'm like, "Cross here." No, a wolf she walked doesn't... into town and ate a baby. She's like, "No, that didn't happen." But yeah. Let's she protect the fleas. Make her clothes all wet and disgusting, be, like instead of like getting it unchanged and showering because she doesn't want to be outed as a as a girl. Yeah. So mm. she's a pathological liar and a psychopath. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wow, there's some Arya hate. No, yeah, I, you know, I have to agree that Arya, like, everybody thinks Arya is, like, awesome and stuff, but she really is, like, psychologically not okay. Damn it. Yeah, but does, yeah. Anyone, does anyone really disagree with Blame that? Blame her? No, that's part of her, well, no, though, also, but, like, no one's saying she's balanced, right? No. Yeah. It's what she's gone I mean, In, the, made in this world, we, we, we just all think that she made some, some lemonade out of those lemons, you know? That's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going back I to just... Stannis, you know, uh, yeah. like, Stannis, I think, has made who he is by all the shitty stuff that happens to him, and yet people blame him for it all the time. Why not Arya? Mm. Exactly. You know, judge them for their current actions, and currently, Arya's a psychopath. Stannis yeah, is a grown as a man. Arya hasn't them, even yeah. had, like, you she hasn't even hit puberty age. yet. She's she's surviving. She's just she's finding a way to survive. I, I don't think you can blame her for that. She yeah. hasn't done anything it's, that. Uh, it's kind of like was it was it George that said about Joffrey? It's like you know he's kind of a shitty little you know thirteen year old. I mean who knows? He maybe maybe he would have grown out of that or something. Like it's just kind of to the extreme. So yeah. you can't really. It's hard to judge someone at that age. Yeah, I've, yeah. I got in. I got inspired to write this because no one ever thinks of Arya as a bad character. You know, she's the one universe... Well, she and, like, Tyrion are the universally liked characters. Mm. Well, pre, like pre-dance them. Tyrion? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, like, I, I see what you're saying, because a lot of people like her rather than dislike her. Like, we can be really critical about it here, but if you look at the fandom as a whole, p- most people like Arya and Tyrion. Also, I was just gonna say that I think Bina said it in the... Um, Beast Dance reread or something like that, where we feel like Arya is awesome because that's what we want to be when we like are dealing with that kind of awful stuff. Murderers. Well, like we her dad murderers. dying and like her not having a home and um, her having well, to deal oh, with and losing her identity. Like you, you would want to be as badass as her if you're going through that. But we more like more people are like Sansa in those situations where they. Yeah, it's a lot of projection because that's a, that's a natural thing. Like that's why we blame victims, right? Like we see someone that gets raped in a dark alley, and we go, "Oh, they shouldn't have been in the dark alley." Instead of saying someone shouldn't rape them, because well, we I think, "Oh, I won't be in a dark alley." <clears throat> well, no, that, but that's that's a natural human response. That can't a lot of we get have. through one podcast that I host without someone bringing up rape? <laughs> okay, nope. okay, better a better analogy. My, my my point is is that Two out of three. Sansa, 
we see all these bad things happen to her and we think, well, I wouldn't react that way. I would never be in that situation. When we probably would have, would have done a lot of the same things she did if we were in her situation because there was no other choice. And then we see Arya, someone who's in these situations and is somewhat kind of taking power and, you know, she's killing some people. And we go, oh, yeah, that's totally what I would do. And we forgive any sort of mistakes she makes because we feel that, like, we it gives us power to identify with her. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So what do you Absolutely. think about Tarver nutting on Prade's grave? <laughs> That's what? the most important part of <laughs> I got this whole, like, flashback to Dunk, you know, burying Sir Arlen. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. And <laughs> you, you made it about dicks, like I said. But no, I really liked it. I honestly didn't even remember this from the first couple times I read it. But it was there's a couple things in this chapter that really kind of made me almost cheer. Like, that was one. And then when they all do have their little stand later on, it's like, and you have my skinning knife. And they all jump up and do all that. So that was uh, coming to his I didn't even I appreciate that. I didn't even remember the mercenary dying. Like, did he catch a flu or something? He had a cough. He was, he was, he, was he had like tuberculosis or something. Uh, okay. The Giles Rosby of the, uh, the Night's nice Watch crew. Yep. For all we know. But, uh, you know, like, I think this chapter is just beautifully written the way, um, like I, I loved just when like the officer and the gold cloaks asks all of them, you know, are you the guys going up to the Night's Watch? And the way he writes that, he doesn't even have to say that somebody, like, who said it. He just says somebody said, might be, you know? Just, I don't know. The way that he writes this chapter is really, really good. The literary quality. Mm. And I I think it's that's severely lacking in, like, book four and five. Uh, I definitely you know, agree the, with that. The little, you know, like, like him putting the acorns on the guy's grave. Little inspiring stuff like that that makes uh. you like really really get into the small stories is kind of lacking later i think and everybody well, coming the... together to protect protect yorin at that at the end i loved that yeah oh yeah but so many of the funny. chapters in the early books they they almost feel like they're all short stories like they all have a beginning middle and end like there's something in each chapter that it's got a climax and comes down and they almost have bookends where in the later books that everything's so spread out that he can't do that in every chapter. I think yeah. it's much easier at this stage to have these very clean and cut chapters. They're not all they're not all like that, but there's so many of them are memorable and the little things like you said jump out at you. And yeah. it's funny to say you say that, Jack, that you think this is so such a well written and, and good chapter in the book, like emphasizing on that, because uh, on the Tower of the Hand it's it's like thirty seven out of seventy, so like middle and uh, of the chapters, so apparently other people think that there are uh, 76 other chapters that are better than this. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus, R- rubes. I mean, well, maybe it's just there like are that. a lot of there are a lot of great chapters in in the first couple books. I I I don't know that this is like my favorite chapter in the whole thing. I was just appreciating this as I was rereading it now. Yeah, I mean, okay, it's just I'm I'm just noting. Yeah, that. And, and but probably the, that's probably more a lot. To do with what happens in those other chapters versus how well they're written sometimes. Sometimes, sure. right. Yeah. <clears throat> also nostalgia. It, yeah, it yeah, is an we know, we know what happens to all these characters in the next three chapters. They're mostly all dead, so that's we have a certain level of, of <laughs> nostalgia. Yeah, so this chapter is probably a little <laughs> right off. Yeah. And yeah. Link, a little thing about Link, like in two chapters about, oh, Link really liked that pepper. Oh, he didn't get no pepper at the wall. Like, that was a little sad thing, too. Yeah. Little little stuff like that just doesn't happen as much in in the later books. And I had uh, one question about how how common are crystals in this world? Because it seems like they just bury crystals with people or put them on their graves. And this is just like a peasant that body that they found. These aren't actual crystals mm. they're using. They're probably using any kind of like quartz stone or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. I was well, say I think it's fairly common because isn't that like a uh, symbol of the seven? So if you believed in them, you probably had like a crystal, like you have a, like a crucifix or something like that, right? Yeah, but like just there's just from a materials point of view, I mean they're not that yeah. they're pretty scarce. Well, well, yeah, yeah, which uh, which which house has that crystal mine, yo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but the, the one of the rich ones. <laughs> if, I mean, it's don't... probably from the reach, some somewhere like the reach or by the silent reach. sisters, and they don't they don't take any money; they just give it all away. Besides, besides, if it's a if it's a religious symbol. Uh, one would think that the religious institution would uh, try to proliferate its uh, its uh, spread through the uh, the realm as much as possible. Yep. Like, ooh, you can have these yeah, like, a sep- <laughs> like, like if, say, the Reach has a lot of diamonds, 
that they would export diamonds to the septs around the other kingdoms and and yeah. they would sell them from there. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, no one can read, so they got to give them something to, you know, it's like they can give them, like, a book of the seven. They they have to have something to... There's, like, Westeros put up. of televangelists telling, you know, this crystal was touched by <laughs> Baylor himself. Baylor the Blessed. Yeah. <laughs> Just four it's, low uh, payments of one one uh, high penny each you can be yours. So. Baylor's knuckle bone, you know. Yeah, this is the main... How many times has that been sold? From the eyes, eyeball Probably of the... Probably ten times. That <laughs> made from the eyeball of the snake that bit Baylor when he's on his journey. Uh, yeah. Just just as an aside, Baylor's the worst, right? <laughs> yeah, he's quite he's quite mm. awesome. Ares is the worst. Really? Of all of them? I mean Yeah. No, Magor's I mean, pretty Yeah, Ma I was about to say Magor too, yeah. Hey, I defend Mangor. He fed those guys before he killed. Okay, them. Ares. Ares isn't that bad. He's a senile old man that his like his council and the people around him should have put in check. It, like I blame other people more than I blame Ares. Also, Aegon the other yeah. way. All right, Ares save it for the Targaryen cast part six. <laughs> Let's go. All right. Oh wait, um, the uh, the travelers, the small folk going towards King's Landing. Did any of you also, like, feel bad about that? I was like, no, don't go. Like, go to the Eyrie or something where it's safer. <laughs> well, the Eyrie's yeah. shut, by That's all true. accounts, right? Yeah. She shut down the veil. But, uh, yeah, it, it does kind of suck gates? where it's like, like where it's like, supposed to camp out the blood gate. I think, I think it would be better for them to go to Lannisport, actually. I mean, um, uh, that would be the, the, the safest, closest large city. Yeah, but they probably have to go through the passport. battle, right? Huh? Do, don't they have to go through um, Rob and... Or are they not there yet? No, they can go through the Silver Road instead, okay. uh, which is a bit more south, but that, that should bring them right to Lannisport anyway, so... And yeah, that's but there's not... no reason that the Lannisters <laughs> would let in the Riverland refugees, and, and that's who they're at war with. No, well, but the, they a... don't... The the difference is that uh, Lannisport is a regular town without necessarily any walls where where uh, where the uh, King's King's Landing is, is is like a has walls around it because of uh, Aegon and his his uh, uh well yeah because of his planning city planning it's essentially also a fortress town right even though it's yeah. Like, they're not really thinking of that. They're just, I mean, in times of war, you go to the capital, you go to the city, that's where you go. They don't have a whole well, place if, to go to. If you, got to, to the, if you got to King's Landing and you saw how many people were there and how bad the conditions were, don't you think a lot of them would just try to get to Highgarden or something? I thought oh, Highgarden. The way, they just not think of that. I think the I way it was there. written is that they were basically starving by the time they got to King's Landing. I mean, yeah. there's only they so make, far... They couldn't continue the journey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even even now when she's meeting them in the Riverlands, they're like dying in droves just walking there. Yeah, yeah. and I bet like the first few people that decide to get the fuck out of Dodge could have made it to high because they could have like hunted their but like eventually you just run out of things to eat, things to hunt. Like so, some would have to have can't... like extreme foresight, forethought to right to have made it out. Yeah. Plus, plus, uh, while. Wow. When they reach King's Landing, the uh, the High Garden host has already, uh, you know, formed and is right. marching up. Uh, so they would actually be walking straight, <laughs> like through uh, a large army, if they wanted to go to High Garden. Oh, I so think the, the, the army is not going to try to kill. It's not just going to kill random people, especially. No, no, away but, from the but, they, but they don't. They don't know that. They know that that Re they would know that Renly is a rebe rebel as well. I mean, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't know that Renly is actually. They might be conscripted or something. Something like that, or just they wouldn't know because they came come from the Riverlands where everything is being burned down. Everything. I mean, they would just assume that it's not safe to go near an, an army, uh, yeah, even right. though it's Renly's army. That's really messed up, though. Like, how if they would have gone there, they would have had like this giant, awesome party and be able to like drink and follow the host for a while. But no, yeah. they just went to King's Landing and died. The life of the of the camp follower is just so uh, glorious and well, like, shiny. Hey, hey, hey! You can <laughs> ascend all the way up to being killed by Joffrey. So yeah, <laughs> no, but like 
the High Garden host, like, it was legitimately a giant party wherever Renly was going, unlike most armies <laughs> that actually have discipline. Right. I'm sure they were also, partying dis- disciplinely, disciplinely. I hope there was, like, some dude at, like, uh, in at the crossroads with some foresight and was like, oh, Caitlin just took uh, Tyrion, they went home, he's like, wife and kids, we're out of here. Shit is about yeah. to go down. <laughs> this place is done. <laughs> Don't look back. Everything happens at the crossroads. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Yeah. So I, I kind of skipped over it when I was doing the summary, but Arya has this kind of long conversation with Jake and Hagar and with Rorge and Biter for the first time in this chapter. Oh, where yeah. Rorge, is, Rorge is saying, I'm going to fuck you, fuck you bloody. That's a conversation? With a stick, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you get the first <laughs> Seems a little one-sided. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think it's very, uh, very interesting. Um, uh, I think it's Biter. No, Rorge. Rorge references her as lumpy head and lumpy face and... And Jake already calls her, like, a beautiful, beautiful boy. Like, they've been paying a lot of attention to her at this point. They've paid attention to all of the nicknames that other people have given her, and they've paid attention and, and figured out that she's a girl. I don't I think, think they've explicitly... Jacket has, but I don't think Roger Biter are smart enough to figure out anything. Also, Rorge, is the one who's... Rorge is the one who's saying her nicknames. And I think that, you know, since Rorge and Biter are huge hulking medicine guys we assume but they might be faceless men they could be just as smart as jack and just playing a character uh no because brianne takes them down like nothing <laughs> i mean she gets her <laughs> face bitten off but like that is not faceless? a faceless man way to go no but isn't there, no there's a whole um no but there's a whole i think it's from a i forget it was from the card game or a semi-canon backstory that rorge was actually like um, ran some kind of like carnival, and Biter was like his a kid he rescued, and like turned him into like a car like a carnival freak or something, and that was their whole backstory. Yeah. I don't, I don't, carny I, folk. Yeah, I, like they like traveled with like a group of mummers or something, and then he like killed somebody. Carnies. That's why they ended up in the black cells. I think somebody asked George about, about like the backstory, and like he just made it off of the top of his head. Like, yeah. Oh, that's right. We forget that. that that's what he did with all of this. <laughs> Touche. All right, on to Bran one. Uh, okay, so Bran one's a weird chapter because there's a lot of shit going down here. We've so first of all, <laughs> do we? <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the the wolves are howling and. It's like setting everyone's teeth on edge. They say the guards can't like are muttering and like um, Maester Lewin can't sleep and but Bran's okay with it. And we get a lot of cool things about uh you know why are they ha- how- howling? Uh, Roderick Castle says who can know the mind of the wolf and he really kind of blows him off. Uh, Farlin says it's freedom they're calling for. Uh, Gage the cook said they want to hunt. Um, Maester Lewin says the wolves often howl at the moon. They must think the comet's a moon. And um, Osha says, uh, "Yeah, the Maester's a fucking idiot. Um, your wolves have more wit than your Maester. They know the truth. The gray men have forgotten. It's blood and fire, boy, and nothing sweet." Uh, the Septon says that the comet is a sword that slays the season. And right after that, uh, the White Raven comes to herald. The uh, beginning of fall, winter, or end of summer. Which one is it? Moon dragons. Right. Okay. Uh, and then old Nan says, uh, well, she sniffs the comet and says, dragons. Dragons, boy. Um, and Hodor said Hodor. Uh, we learn that the fucking asshole little and big Walders come. And uh, they didn't like the uh, howling of the wolves either. Uh, let's see. Bran remembers his falling, kind of, but when he does, it kind of gives him a, a little case of the D. His uh, stomach kind of tightens up and doesn't do very well. Um, let's see. Oh, and then he, all of a sudden he wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks of uh, that he'll talk to the wolves. And so he just starts uh, wowing out the window. So then everyone wakes up and uh, let's see. Maester Lewin comes in and uh, he's like, uh, quit making all that noise. And then, um, let's see. Okay, so then we get a good kind of exchange with them. Uh, in sleep, I turn into a wolf. Do wolf stream. All tr- 
creatures dream, I think, yet not as men do. Do dead men dream? Some say yes, some no. The dead themselves are silent on the matter. Very witty. Thank you, Lewin. Uh, do trees dream? Trees? No. They do, Bran said with certainty. They dream tree dreams. I dream of the, the trees sometimes. A weirwood like the one in the godswood, it calls to me. The wolf dreams are better. I smell things, and sometimes I can taste the blood. Mr. Lewin uh, is not very comfortable with that. Kind of tugs at his chains and said, uh, maybe you should socialize instead of dreaming about tasting blood. Um, and then, oh shit, we go into uh, the game, the crossing, and uh, how awful it is, but and how uh, Shaggy Dog attacked one of the Walders, so now both of the uh, wolves are locked up in the Godswood. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and apparently the Frays are always looking to screw over people with uh, mayhaps. And... Uh, Rickon brings the Walders down to the uh, crypts, and Bran gets all pissed because that's a Stark place, and they had, uh, they shouldn't be going down there. Should have just and buried then, them down there. Yeah, that that would have worked. Well, I mean, um, like then then at least the phrase would have a better reason for stuff going down, like it does. I don't know. Maybe maybe the whole red wedding wouldn't have happened. I don't know. Yeah. So. Um, so Mace Loon gives Bran a sleeping draft. And after hearing everything, I think the sleeping draft was actually something to promote the wolf dreams. Because ever huh. since that, he actually gets it. And Master Lewin had studied the old uh, mysteries, he said, and, you know, didn't believe that magic was in the world. But I think because he studied it, he kind of was getting, like, a weird thing about uh, about Bran. So that's my crackpot theory. Mm -hmm. um, Could be. Nope. Okay, sorry. so... No? Nope. We'll see. So, uh... Osha uh, lingers behind. She says, uh, it's the wolf dreams again. You should not fight it so hard. Uh, I see you talking to the heart tree. The gods might be trying to talk to back. Talk back during, like, as he's a warg. And then, uh, blah, blah, blah. He turns, he falls asleep, dreams that he's summer. And then, um, we get the ending, which is great. Uh, but beyond the walled woods stood, still stood the great gray caves of Man Rock. Winter fell, he remembered, the sound coming to him suddenly. Beyond its sky-tall man cliffs, the true world was calling, and he knew he must answer or die. Mm. Yeah, it was bum, really great bum, to get the bum. view from, from uh, Summer's point of view. Man Rocks. Hmm. Again, with the testicles. Yeah, no, just realized that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I get to cut it out, though. So fine. He's Laugh all you want. Man, <laughs> You're right. You and your testicles all the, all the time. Oh, I just love Man Rock so much. Man Rock's Man yeah. Rock's Man Rock's. Doesn't matter. No one's ever going to hear it, so laugh it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, guys, send me those files. Oh, damn it. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, basically we get the uh, development of the relationship between Bran and the wolves and how it kind of seems unnatural to most of the other people except for Osha and Old Nan who says, oh, the Starks all have wolf blood in them, but some have them stronger than others. Um, and then, yeah, we just, in the middle, out of nowhere, we get this long description of the game, which uh, I just don't like, but otherwise I like this chapter. Yeah. I'd like to think that when George gave this to his editor, they were like, well, you've got to explain this, uh, you know, Lord of the Crossing game. And then he explained it way too much, but he probably asked <laughs> yeah. for it. Yeah, over three pages. It'll be the next Quidditch. <laughs> well, as I was reading it, I thought it was, like, such an appropriate game for the phrase. I was like, oh, of course they play that game. It's, like, their thing. Like, <laughs> Yeah, they're a little conniving, like, oh, we're looking, like, at any angle to fuck you over. Yeah, because that's the yeah, only thing I they actually... do. I actually didn't like that because I, th I feel like George really pushes on us these first couple books that like every fray is skeevy. If he's got like 90 grandkids or hundreds of grandkids or something, shouldn't there be like a regular proportion of good people in there? Like father and like his grandson kid. twice removed, you know? <laughs> No, well, I don't Martin think Big, Big Walder isn't particularly bad. We know that like Little Walder is actually... Oh no, I get it mixed up. Yeah. Little Walder is actually one, the one is actually like, kind older. of like yeah the small the smaller one is the meaner one and that's the one who gets uh, you know killed by 
turned into a pirate. Not turned yeah. into a pirate. But, but I mean, you got to think about it. Like, like Walter Frey is such a piece of junk, and he, he he's making everyone basically fight, you know, for scraps, and like he takes care <laughs> of his family; they don't starve. But he 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 breeds this environment, so the very few people that come out of it really good and are still kind of decent people in the phrase are actually like really good people. I think. Hmm. I think there's yeah, still so, too many of them that are bad people. Yeah, and uh, do you guys all buy the theory that Big Walder was actually the killer of Little Walder? That it wasn't uh, the Manderleys? No. Because How does later on, die? he gets, he's, he's get, it's like his uh, throat slit and like left in the snow in uh, Dance of Dragons. And that's what... Yeah, well, wasn't that uh, like, it's just like, hey, one oh, more step to being, you know, w- one step up wasn't he like ahead of him in the line of secession or something? Right. Yeah, but there were still both like forty people behind. Yeah, yeah. but I just got the feeling that Big Walder really like, like attached to like Ramsey and kind of like. Oh, he definitely got did. even more sadistic, and he made a couple of things where it was like, "I'd do anything to you know be the heir to the towers or something." Hmm. So, I, I don't know. It, there's just a couple of things I was like, ooh, Mad Max is on. Yeah, I, um, I definitely got that impression, too. Speaking of crazy, did Rickon in this chapter, like, he's laughing at Shaggy Dog, like, destroying one... Which Walter was it? Um, but... Little Walter, I think. Yeah. Like, he's... Shaggy Dog's eating him alive, and Rickon's like, ah, that's so funny. Like... <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not like quite like Sweet Robin levels, but you know, he's, he's yeah. enjoying it. But he can't really perceive what's going on. He doesn't. Um, he hasn't learned empathy yet. That's true. Uh, yeah. But I mean, when you're still seeing that kind of behavior from a very young child, it's just like, how are they going to end up when they get older? Are they going to learn? Are they not going to learn? Like, he doesn't have much of a chance to learn, so I... I uh, the king in the north? Um, obviously. Yeah, he's also, he's <laughs> hanging out with the great finishing school on Skago, so he's going to turn out just fine. <laughs> 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 over there. We know that. I mean, when your mother, like, rejects you and doesn't pay attention to you at all, like, can you really blame him? God, yeah, exactly. No, one. because that doesn't, that never, like, creates any psychological problems. <laughs> cool. <laughs> So, I was kind of curious about this. Why the hell is Shaggy Dog still alive? Maybe this is more of a Montana thing, but out here, like, if a rancher has a dog, and, like, the dog gets old and it bites somebody, like, like they get maybe a six-month grace period when they're a puppy that they can maybe bite a little until they're fully trained. But if, if a dog bites someone out here, they're dead. That's yeah, when they get old yellered. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. that's like the governor's dog. It's probably uh... like a little different, you know? Yeah, that's yeah, like if exactly. you. Yeah. That's like if a dog if bites somebody's kid bite. and they, tra- they tell him they have to put him down because, or else they'll sue or whatever. But yeah, like, like Cersei. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Cersei I mean, is the dog I in have... the city, and and this is the dog in the country, and he is he is trained, you know, he's trained to be an attack dog, I think. So. Also, the dire wolves are so like prominent with Winterfell that I feel like anybody in Winterfell would be like, "No, the, those are the dire wolves. We can't do that." You know. Oh no, so... Lewin, Lewin, like would love to kill those things. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean... There's there are so many people that would, but like they're still dire wolves, so you're not gonna. And they're the king or the prince's dire wolves, so you're not yeah. gonna go kill them. Does anybody I mean, get like, savage do... while Ned's do... around? Mm. None that we hear of. They're still puppies. Yeah, he needs... yeah, exactly. He he pieces out like just as they get the wolves. Also, yeah, because I feel like Ned Ned would be the guy to kill the wolf if it's sad. Well, he did. He killed Lady. He, no, I mean he would kill Shaggy Dog if, if Shaggy Dog was doing this stuff and he was around. Well, also I feel like if Ned was there, they wouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. I feel like Shaggy Dog's acting out because Rickon's acting acting out that none of his parents are there. So. Being Mace Lewin right now, I would be pretty freaked out by the Stark kids. I mean, the one is talking about the tree, uh, trees calling him and blood tasting in his mouth. And, like, have you ever heard, like, a, as a small child talking about their dreams? Some of them sound really, really freaky. And they just. No. It, the, 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 oh, God. It, it is freaky. Especially, like, um, like, invisible friends. And it's like, no, they're seeing fucking ghosts. Like. <laughs> 
I, I know they like, are. <laughs> yeah, something uh, those like stories that. are the best, I mean, though. <laughs> Drop that yeah, Fred was really. not a ghost. The way, uh, but the way it was an awful Fred movie. Oh, man. Don't you diss Drop Dead Fred. That's my third favorite movie. <sighs> oh, but your no, first favorite is Postman, so... <laughs> Well, the way Braden Brand is talking is exactly exactly like that, and between that and the way Rick and, and <laughs> is just completely out of control with Shaggy Dog, is it's just I would as Mason Lewin just think, fuck these child ch- children are really crazy, and I'm uh yeah I mean I would have gotten out of Dodge if it if it weren't my children. <laughs> I mean can't they send? But as they should be they... dysregulated though, like. Like, I, I work in child development, so, like, this all seems very normal to me for them to be acting strange, like, just by, like, what I've seen, I guess, but... Can't he send for, like, a septo or some lady from a local village or something to take care of the kids? Like, I think that would be, like, the first thing that they did when Septa Mordain left and they still have kids there. It's like, get get somebody else. Yeah, should, though. Somebody who knows that, that uh, children are tiny psychopaths. <laughs> there aren't a lot of septic in the North, though, I don't think. <laughs> no, no, but, I, I mean, the, the equivalent, I'm sure, like, yeah. there's some some mom who is maybe her kids died or something. And so, she's like, in the old gods somewhere. equivalent, I think that's OSHA. Perfect. <laughs> OSHA approved. Like, Higher. it's still hard for the kids to just be like, oh, now you're my new mom. Great. Like, they're still gonna not know... They're still gonna be difficult. I mean, even even if they get some lady who's genuinely trying and she's not doing great, that's got to be better than what's happening right now, right? Like, yeah, wolves I mean, she had, apart. Yeah, right now, the the kids they have OSHA, which is she's always talking about ah, uh, uh, dead things are coming and and you should beware and stuff like that. Yeah. She's not a great model. And then you have Lewin, who has no fucking idea what to do with kids. Essentially, and then you have uh, what's the last one? Oh yeah, old Nan. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I'm, two ladies I'm thinking, telling them about zombies and and uh, yeah. an old dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm I'm thinking any other woman would be a nice uh, substitute, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, Veon Pool doesn't he have a wife? Because uh, he has his daughter Jane. Shouldn't the mom still be around? She could like raise them. Possibly. I don't think she's ever mentioned. I don't remember her by name. She, prob- she probably died in childbirth. I mean, it's yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty North thing to happen. Yeah. Well, if they also took know. a bunch There's... of like guys off to war with them, they should have like a bunch of lonely women out there, I guess. Like With this culture in this world, they, that should be happening, I guess. Yeah, there'd be a lot of women with like... I don't know. I think they'd be busy like farming and shit, because winter is coming. Yeah. True that. But there's got to be some lady. I mean, the the Starks are relatively rich. They can just like put out a Craigslist ad or something. <laughs> you know, Westeros Craigslist. With that internet. <laughs> it's by Raven. I just, I don't think Catelyn would really <clears throat> appreciate or allow you know anyone else to even step into her shoes, however temporary it would be. Well, she doesn't. Oh, but she's them. okay with leaving them for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she has to rob. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't seem too opposed to Septa Mordain raising Sansa and Arya. It's not like she's in there teaching them knitting. No, she's... Uh, That's her job. She though. seems... Uh, she I'm, seems I'm, like I'm raining in the cat hate right now, but... <laughs> she, she's an absentee mom even when she's there. She, like, doesn't do shit. She doesn't raise her kids. Oh, uh, okay, I mean, that's a then... brand. Yeah, yeah she yeah, is just, she's quite... Just brand. No, she is present. She just... Uh... I mean, like like in the modern day, we we send our kids to school, right, and or to preschool or whatever. So we kind of also do the same thing. We kind of send them off to be educated in the ways of life instead of doing it ourselves, which we might should might. But be. we gotta work. Cat doesn't I mean, have to work. <laughs> yeah, she's got nothing else to do. She's just like sitting around oh. while her kids are learning from oh. some other lady. I, I think that's a slippery slope to go down. I mean, really. Uh, you don't you don't really know what's, what Kat is doing er, all I day. Mean, I mean, no, but I even assuming it's... she's as... Sorry, you can go. Even, even assuming she's as busy as Ned. Like, Ned's a busy guy. We actively see Ned, like, raising his kids and teaching them things. And 
And we also have Arya and Sansa chapters while they're at Winterfell. Shouldn't we see Arya and Sansa learning some stuff from their mom? Like Bran well, is learning from his dad? I think that we might well, be like being a little bit critical. Like we, In the books, we do only see Ned parent like a lot, except for like Catelyn with Bran and with Rob. That that's like the only things that we really see. We see Ned with, I think, all of them at some point individually. Yeah, yeah. Isn't, Ned's a doesn't great cat. Say like Bran and Lucan are kind of like her favorite. They're like her babies. No, that's just yeah. Bran. She's she's Bran's batting like two time. for five. <laughs> <laughs> she she's like Bran and Rob, and everyone else can go fuck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite that bad. <laughs> you have a very divisive uh, opinion on this. I, I think. yeah, because because she le- she she releases Jamie Lannister because she doesn't care about her daughters. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> only when they're the I mean, only ones she has left, though. Keep in mind. Yeah, she she does that after. <laughs> well, she lost after. her two favorite. No, 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 wait, like, wait, wait. Right, okay, pull I'm up the B remember, spot. Like, does, <laughs> does she do that before or after? She After. hears about, and because she After. she has Rob number one still, but right, I'm but trying to remember because loses... the book didn't the book and the show do it differently. No. In the book, she loses Bran and Rickon, and she's down. And then to she three. does it, yeah. and she's but, like, you know, she's like, I used to care about two. I guess I can care about three now. Well, if, I mean, like, I, I don't Jesus. think this is actually her, but like, you can argue that like she did it because they're the only heirs left. But you, know. you mean besides Rob? Yeah. They can just like yeah. make another one. <laughs> okay, I'm just blown away by the cat hate all of a sudden. I mean I not all of a sudden, but it's it's just very intense right now. I mean Well I mean uh, hey, I feel and like... I'm raining it back, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well Cat isn't my favorite character, but I, like she is a you don't, sh- you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm playing a lot of I'm playing a lot of devil's advocate here. I do give her credit like where it's due and I feel like she is like out of all like out of like all the women that are there. She has like the most power per se with like telling Rob what to do and with being like a Tolly and a Stark, I guess. Um but I just I get mad that we don't see her parent as much. I don't know. We, we really see it with not, Ned, but we don't see it with her. I, th- I think it's just not very pertinent to the story. I mean, pertinent to the story, really. I think that all of the scenes where Ned parents, quote-unquote parents, uh, uh, is when it's moving the story forward, in a sense. I mean, he's he's letting Arya learn how to, to water dance and whatever stuff like that I mean telling John that he's gonna have uh, the story about his mother when when he comes back all the, that sort of stuff is moving this story forward but do imagine that 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 she does parent her children to, even though we don't hear about it I mean she does sort of parent Rob uh, uh, when she comes back from uh, from King's Landing and I mean, she is, yeah. I mean, she's over Bran. I think. I think you're just being quite harsh on him or her, really. Rob, I mean, Rob is kind of a man grown, right? Like in that way too. She's she's trying to find that balance between, oh, I'm his mom and I want to say something, but also he's leading a whole army. Yeah. And if, so, she, if yeah. she has that instinct, I mean, she she would have used that also on her other kids. There wouldn't wouldn't just be feelings for for, for Bran and for. Uh, for Rob, I mean, she does all. Most of the kids are like her more than they're like Ned. Essentially, it's only well, like looks. Yeah, yeah, but also character-wise, most of them are more soft-spoken, more uh, likable than than Ned and and. Then the and, Quiet uh, Wolf was soft-spoken. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you take Bran, you take uh, you take uh, Sansa, you take Rob. All of them are more like their mother in and also demeanor than than they are like their father they just okay. try to mute okay so you're saying that i think i have to disagree don't... with you on that okay because yeah. i think looks wise for sure but you know ned's not out there i don't know i i, I don't see him being like you know self-promoting or you know grandiose like robert is 
You know, he he still has to be in that leadership position, but he's not like a, a dick about it. So, so you said that um, well. the reason that we don't the reason that we don't get a scene of of Cat parenting her kids is because there's not much way that it would move the story along. But I think it would have been real easy for George to write in like a scene where Cat tries to teach Sansa something that's very valuable to her. And Sansa ignores it at the time, and then later to the books, he could call back to that scene as Sansa gets more mature and and have her learn from her mom, uh, you know, in the past. It'd also be an uh, easier plenty... way to make her more likable. Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of opportunity for her children to learn valuable lessons from her, but we just don't see it. You mean like take one scene that has Septima Lamore in it and switch it with Cat, and then boom, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Septa Lamora isn't giving so much like really uh, deep advice that might help them later. She she's teaching them like manners and stuff. But it would have been easy for Kat to sit down with Arya or with Sansa and to have some talk with them that had deep meaning later and could actually develop their characters more. Or but even a flashback. Happen. Yeah, I, I would actually but, say that like Septa Lamora. I mean, that's what saves Sansa is her, you know, acting like even though the Hound like you know makes fun of it, but just like. Okay, I gotta use my courtesy. Like that's my thing. Right. Yeah. Before the YouTube, before the YouTube comments start, we're talking about Septa Mordain, not Septa Lamore. Continue. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's no. how I was laughing. Save we're we're not comments. talking about oh, yeah. Bob Mom. We're talking. Oh about yeah. We're not, on, we're not on the river. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Um, and but, also, like, we we have that one scene where she's a complete dick to John, but we have absolutely zero scenes where she's talking to Rickon about anything. Or Arya, yeah. or Sansa, or I mean, Sansa. anybody except for Rob. She doesn't have a conversation with anybody else. How old is Rickon again? Like four, four. right? He's three yeah. in the first book, so probably yeah. Four right like now. there's not a lot yeah. of talking going on. That okay, age. so so if if you're gonna have this discussion, we should. Um, I'm just gonna have to reference back to the GR discussion where I was the uh, the one who was harping on about him being not necessarily a good parent or no no evidence of it i mean uh, and some persons just said that we need to uh, s- we shouldn't just assume that he's a bad parent because uh, because there is no uh, fact that he's not and vice versa I mean, right, it's just you're putting a lot of assumptions on stuff we just don't have information for but it, we have active fact, we have active evidence that she's a bad parent when she ignores rickon When's that? She, uh, like she, again, he's so he, he's so young though, and she's she's got a lot to do. I think personally, I, I don't think she's ignoring him as much as you're making it out to be. Yeah, what what, what, and, this, I mean, her what big, do you want? The biggest thing in her defense is the fact that Bran falls in like the third fourth chapter of the book, and everything else. And that's yeah, what we're she, thinking about. She, yeah. We don't get many like halcyon days of oh, just the good times in Stark Castle, like when she could be a good mother. We don't. We I don't mean, get, we don't, we're not there for that. I mean, but it's so look, bad gonna, that I'm, Rob is talking to her about it. He's like, Mom, yeah, seriously, pay but attention to your I'm going to say that's, that's, that's really, really natural, though, because yeah, it's like we've got a, I've got some friends of ours who um, they have a kid, and, you know, their two-year-old has cancer, and, Oy. you know, yeah, oh, it's, it's not, it's not going to end well. But, you know, they've basically ignored their other children. They have a newborn, and they have, like, a five-year-old, and, and, you know, you can't. You no one can tell them what is right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, they could. There are. I think they're at like the. You know, they have one of those houses where the kids can stay and where the. You know, for. It's really sad, but you know they could have brought their other kids along and they've left them with their their grandparents because they want to focus on the kid that's that's, you know, dying. I mean. Well, well how also, do you? I mean, I mean that's that's very natural. But. Assuming that those other kids are still doing school, like they just can't relocate for six months, you know. No, they rec- something they, more no, they, they've 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 completely moved to a different city, and you know the kids are just kind of in the same city, just with other family, because they don't oh, want Jesus. them to be around it, sort of thing. So, and I mean, like you, we can look at that and go, oh, I wouldn't do that, you know. But unless you're in that situation, you really just don't know. Oh. Way you know, emotions run so high. Trust me, in my family, I like I learned a long time ago. You like you don't comment on how other people raise their kids, but this is yeah. fictional books. 
<laughs> yeah. Even so, yeah. even if even even if you're right, you just don't comment because right, right. You know. It's not your kid, and it's not yours. Oh, what situation. you let your baby play with bullets? Maybe that's not safe. Screw okay. you! I'm a good parent. <laughs> but Catlin's not talking back to us anytime soon, so let's just let loose. <laughs> Well, As opposed think... to what we have been doing for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so now the gloves can come off. I, fe- I mean, honestly, Matt's I feel over like... here like, hold me back, bro, hold me back. <laughs> I mean, I-, I feel like I'm just a little bit critical about it because I'm, like, I... My research isn't parenting, so I-, I feel like maybe I'm just, like, a little bit more critical of Kat than, like, I should be. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I-, I agree with what you guys were saying. Yeah, let's also just look at the timeline, like in in ending of this discussion. I mean, she, the when she when we start the story, they they are things are okay. I mean, they learn about John Aaron's dead and whatever, uh, but nothing is saying this is in indicating that the rest that all the kids are in in great danger. As it is, I mean. Arya and Sansa just it seems like they're being it's fine they're just going to be right. married to, to to people and whatever going to King's Landing uh, so no there's no real reason why George should work in a chapter where where uh, Kat should like like give them a life lesson or something to help them away on their way uh, and later on then they're they're out of the way they're not even there uh Plus, okay, Rickon, he, it is a sad story, but she is also in grief from Rat, from Bran as long as she's there. And after that, what is she going to, when she goes on the road with the, uh, uh, the Castellan, uh, she can't Roderick. bring a three-year-old uh, on uh, Roderick. She can't bring a three-year-old on a road down on a secret mission to, to King's right. Landing. Uh, no, right, Gil. So, I mean, so I... there's there's circumstances all the time that prevents her from from uh, parenting her children, uh, yeah. or at least showing us that, that she's parenting yeah. them. But I mean, even like um, in the one exchange with uh, Ned, and this is totally up for grabs on who's the worst parent after Bran sees the execution, <laughs> and he's mm-hmm. talking about bringing Rick on to see the next one. <laughs> he's like, oh, it won't yeah. be three forever. And she's just like, oh, well, uh, Starks. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, I, you I think silly there, Starks. There, there could have been some conversation there or even some conversation with Arya. Arya wanting to go see the next execution. Why does Rickon get to see it? Or what? Is it something like that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they're all bad parents. I mean, you said there's, I don't think there's a good parent. Maybe Cersei is the best parent. And that's good. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we're ending this on something non-controversial. We all agree yeah. Cersei's the best parent. <laughs> all right. So, moving on to Sansa one. Okay. So, um, this is when Joffrey's name day and Sir Ares comes to get Sansa and escort him to the tournament. Uh, she asks him what he thinks about the comet, and he replies that he thinks it's the celebration. Okay. <laughs> Hello? He thinks it's to celebrate uh, Joffrey because it's Lannister Crimson. Uh, Sansa's wearing a dress with long sleeves to hide the bruises left by Sir Boros when he beat her, uh, when Joffrey learned of Robert's victories. Um, and the only reason why Sansa likes Sir Ares the most is he hesitated and didn't want to beat her, but eventually did. And uh, this just shows how cruel George is, because not, like, not that he didn't do it, but the nicest person he decides to ship away to Dorne, so he just wants to make Sansa's life miserable. Um, going on, the tourney starts, and it's really terrible compared to the last one with the hand. Um, there's a lot less knights. I think it kind of highlights how terrible the Kingsguard is, too, um, just considering how in the past, when the Kingsguard's road was a great event, and now it's just kind of disgusting, and like they're kind of ex- expected to win, and it's kind of sad. Um, and then it goes on, various uh, participants such as Sir Marin, Sir, ba- Sir Balin, who are both in the Kingsguard, Sir Horus, Sir Haber, Sir Dantos, and Moros Slint. Uh, this is Janus Slint's son, who was raised to being a lord after Janus killed 
like help capture Ned and then like raise the head, and that's why Sir, Sir, ooh, Santa hates him. Uh, then Sir Dantos comes to ride up, and he's so drunk that he can't participate. Joffrey obviously isn't happy about this, so uh, he laughs and decides that he should um, drink himself to death. Essentially, horrified, Sansa tells him to stop because it'll bring ill luck on him. Completely bullshitting it, but like it shows how clever she is and able to think on her feet. Luckily, Sanders there to speak on her behalf, and Joffrey agrees to kill him the next day. And then Santa showing Santa again showing how clever she was does the whole. Uh, he he's just a fool, so you should dress him up in motley and have him be his fool. And Joffrey reluctantly, reluctantly agrees. Also at this time, Tommy wants to ride, and Joffrey really doesn't want to do it. But finally, after Marcella, Tommen, Santa all like begging and essentially bring up Cersei, he reluctantly agrees. And um, he happens uh, he's riding against essentially like a straw man, and he falls off his horse. And, like, everyone else tries to go run up and see if he's okay, but Joffrey, being a little prick and dick, decides not to. Um, what also is good is um, Marcella has the clever line of when Joffrey replied that you're being childish, she replies that we are children, showing how awesome Marcella is. And then the chapter ends with Tyrion riding in, Joffrey being a dick about Tyrion um, being there. Um, and Tyrion has all his cell swords and the mountain men, and he is off to go see Cersei. Yeah, no. that's true. So I, Plus, I really liked in this cha- chapter where, like, like I could see Joffrey's face, like where he's like trying to figure out if Sansa was mocking him or not. Like you could kind of, I, I forget what George writes, but he's like he gave like a like a squint or something like that, and it's like I could totally see that face, you know, like that, like. Just like, uh, are you making fun of me, or... And then the Hound's like, oh no, it's true. I view the character Joffrey in my head a lot differently than he looks in the show. I think also this show kind of... This chapter, like, shows how, like, clever the Hound is also. And, like, how he can crack a couple, like, little jokes that he made. And how he thinks on his feet, and, like, he's not more of a buffoon as he looks like in the show. But that's... Yeah, he's pretty smart. <clears throat> Yes. Also, he knows there's a line that he can he can go much further with Joffrey than pretty much anybody else, but he won't cross it. But, I mean, anyone else says the things that the Hound does, and Joffrey would ask the Hound to slap him or do, do worse. Also, he cares a lot about this little <clears throat> Fight bird. to the death. This also had, like, my one of my favorite little scenes of just when, like, Tyrion shows up, and, uh, well, first, Marcella's like, <laughs> Joffrey yells at her, he's like, don't be, don't be childish. She's like, we're children, yeah. we're supposed to be childish. That and then just I love that, that's such a great... <laughs> it is, and then <laughs> just... Yeah. <clears throat> when, like, you know, he meets them and Joffrey's just still being just a dick and, you know, Tyrion actually, like, spins her in a circle and Tom and Tommen is just so cute, you forget, because in the show he's, like, some 14-year-old kid, but in the in the book he's, like, eight and he's just this chubby little kid who just wants to ride a horse and, and be a knight. And, uh, it's, Dude, uh... How, how funny is it when they describe him, like, like chugging along? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a fellow chubby eight-year-old, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have uh, <laughs> the cool uncle on your side. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, I gave him props when he got knocked off his horse, and then he, you know, he, he wanted to go right back and do it again. Yeah, yeah even so the hound be... says uh, the boy's brave or something like that, or he has courage. Or... Yeah, and and Sansa even says, "Oh, I wouldn't mind marrying Tommen." Yeah. Do you think if 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 Tommen had been allowed to train in, in the yard like everybody else, that he would actually make a good warrior? I think he's allowed to train in the yard. Him and Bran went at it at Winterfell. Later, Cersei, like, keeps him from being trained by... Oh, Loris. by Loras, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good... Uh, never really like, thought she's, of it. she's actively keeping him from training in military stuff later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I so feel you, like maybe you... Robert had some influence over, like, the sons being trained a little bit more, and then Cersei mm-hmm. got a little bit crazy and was like, no, you can't do this. can't yeah. have to keep him out of harm's way. But I feel like All right, I'll on. take back yeah. my Cersei no, comment. But I, no, but I think that's later <laughs> on, though. I think that he could be training... It's possible. We don't know at this point, like between Robert's death and uh, the Cersei POV. I mean, and and also, I mean, if you if you want to believe in Martin genetics, he would be an awesome swordsman, right? If he took from his father. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he would have the talent there. Plus, he he is not uh, easily dissuaded from from trying again. So. 
there's two very promising uh, uh, qualities to have if you want to be a good swordsman, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, like certain talents like that are passed along genetically, even in the real world. Like athletic people, uh, even when they're separated from their kids, tend to have more athletic kids and stuff like that. But, but. Jamie is like the only great warrior in his family, right? Tywin wasn't a great warrior. Tyrek wasn't a great warrior. Well, Tywin is a great strategist, I guess. Or yeah, he's or... a smart guy. So well, Tommen you, might be very smart. But the twins are not from Tywin. I, uh, I feel like but... I don't. But... <laughs> even, but even Ares is not noted as a great warrior. Yeah, but the Targaryens are. Like generally, yeah, some of them are. Like two. Three. Right, you, you have you have at least a a pattern that's established over several generations that that they do have good warrior genes every once in a while, but the Lannisters like Jaime is the only one. Oh, I think l- longer b- back you you do find people that are known for their military prowess or their sword prowess as well. But I mean, oh, Garion could have been you know he got the Valyrian sword and everything. We just don't know. Oh, yeah. Wasn't yeah, there maybe. a good lion or, like, Lannister back in Duck and Egg that was really good? The little lion. Yeah. Oh, the little lion. No, the young lion? No, the little lion was the was no, 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 no. great guy who killed the... Uh, like, right. in the first book, uh, like, in the first one, like, one of the knights that, in, like, the oh, Battle yeah. of the Seven. Yeah, so, but I don't think yeah, but... he, uh, he got, like, knocked on his ass pretty quick, if I remember. Yeah. He was old, I think that... he was, like, the gray lion. Yeah, the gray lion or old lion or something, yeah. That's probably a cadet house, right? Because there's, like, the Lannisters of Casterly Rock, and then there's a pile of Lannisters from Lannisport. Yeah. Well, the guy in that story was Lord Lannister, so I assumed he was the, the head Lannister. Oh, well, that might be then. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. We don't, I don't think we have enough facts on the matter to know if there's no one else in, in the entire history of Lannisters that uh, is actually good with a sword. Right, or yeah. the Selmys or something, you know? Like... But, yeah, there's going to be a breakout person every now and then. That although you know. I think it is worth noting that that Joffrey is actually isn't he like fairly competent physically? Like I, th- I thought he was like tall and athletic for his age. I think he was yeah. tall. I don't think I mean Arya beat him down, so I don't know how athletic he is. But well, Arya, she did have help. She did have help from a, a wolf, right? Arya like yeah. hit him in the head. She was also from eight. Behind. Yeah, but she she sneak attacked him. That's not the same as like a pitched fight. Like she hit him in the back of the head, and he easily disarmed her afterwards. And and Joffrey fights Rob in in Winterfell several times, and it I they make it sound like it's a dead heat. And Rob is supposed to be a pretty good fighter. Yeah, and and three years older. I mean, yeah. already already like more uh, physically powerful than than you would imagine uh, Joffrey being. Being thirteen versus a, a fifteen, sixteen year old, that's a, a not a fair comparison. <laughs> yeah, you should, but, you should be getting uh, but, his butt kicked. But do they do they fight? I thought Joffrey wanted to fight with steel and Roderick Cassell was only like, No, we're that's, doing that's wooden swords. They fought, they fought like fifty times before that. Oh, really? And, and it says of, that Yeah, they they had been fighting like all day and he gets sick of fighting with the training swords and he wants to fight with with real swords. Uh, yeah, but I yeah. think he only he only said that because he knew that they wouldn't let him. Because he, I don't think Joffrey was right. a really good sword. Yeah, and Jon Snow <laughs> actually calls him like a little shit, right? Yeah, that's his personality. Not. I, I think that Joffrey is actually a fairly good fighter. Well, yeah, but yeah. He, then why doesn't he like lead a stortes? Like he shoots people with a crossbow from like the the Isn't... wall top, like. Because... I I understand like he he isn't allowed to young. during the Battle of Blackwater, but like during the riots and so, like the people that like came to the gate that he started like just killing with a crossbow. Like why didn't he just lead something small? I They're mean, peasants. Suicide. Well, <laughs> yeah, suicide. That and, it's jo- and it's, that and it's Joffrey. I mean, he is yeah quite. Uh, he's not well adjusted as a person either. So. He might yeah. might be able to cut them down. I'm not saying that he is, but he, but he wouldn't do that because it's much funnier just to shoot them down as he would rabbits. Uh. Yeah, or he's or <laughs> you know you could he could still be a coward and a really good fighter. 
you know, he could be scared of the mob and shoot them with a crossbow, but that doesn't mean that he couldn't go down there and kill them all with a sword. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't been fostered. He hasn't been a ward with with uh, uh, another house like Jamie was with the Malisters, right? So you you won't know. You won't know if he could have been a good knight. He's he's still a product of his mother's uh, like child rearing and his father's uh, absentee uh, way of being there. I I think right. that. I, I think that Robert would make them just train constantly, like even if it wasn't himself training them. I feel like he would, like his first priority would be to make the master at arms train them rigorously oh, yeah. all the time. He, he the, wants the, like martial boys, right? I mean, there's no way that Cersei Robert probably didn't let him. <clears throat> well, also, or he's just like drunk and fucking, and was like, um, assuming they're training. <laughs> <laughs> well, also at, at the. Um, at the end of the chapter, when Tyrion um, says "sorry for your loss to Joffrey," he's like, "Who?" He like completely forgets about his dad dying. So it, oh, yeah. it really shows like yeah. that he really didn't like Joffrey doesn't care about him all that much, and that just might be because Joffrey's a dick. But um, well, he's a sociopath. He doesn't care about anybody. Also, his dad's not dead. <laughs> what? Yeah, but he doesn't know that. <laughs> oh, gotcha. He hasn't read the books. <laughs> <laughs> He's not Deadpool. He doesn't know what the writers are thinking. <laughs> um, I feel like Sansa gets lost in this chapter a little bit. I, f- I feel like there's a lot of other things going on that we forget that she's the one that's a POV. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, between Tyrion, the Hound, and Dantos, it's like, wait a minute. What happened in this chapter? Yeah. Oh, this was Sansa? Tyrion won. It's actually kind of... I don't know, it's one of my favorite chapters. But um, Tyrion arrives with Bronn and Timot. He's being denied access to the small council chamber by Sir Mandon because people don't know shit, and he's a dwarf. Tyrion finally gets his way through. Cersei's in a meeting with the small council. Prince letter, presents his letter from Lord Tywin, naming himself Hand of the King, quite conveniently, until such a time as Tywin arrives to assume the role, which, I mean, at this point, who the hell knows when that's going to be? Cersei is rightfully angry and claims the appointment is invalid. So they're about to have, like, Law and Order Westeros, I think, here. Um, But Tyrion points out that there's little she can do about it because Tywin, and he's a badass, and just deal with it. He asks the council members to uh, give him some time alone with his sister. On the way out, Lord Baelish asks Tyrion if he needs quarters, and Tyrion says he'll be staying in the Tower of the Hand, bitch. Well, Baelish is surprised, given what happened to John and Eddard, the last two hands. Tyrion tells him that the hand before him died uh, in the Sack of King's Landing. The hand before him was burned alive, and the two before him died penniless. Lord Tywin was the last hand to leave with his life and property intact, which is kind of important. And I guess he's on there on behalf of Lord Tywin, so he thinks things are going to work out differently for him. Let's see when the others leave. Cersei... Threatens to call the letter of forgery, throw Tyrion in the dungeon, but Tyrion tells her that he can get Jamie back, which piques her interest. Uh, and she he's at, tells her to fill him in on recent events. Joffrey was supposed to pardon Eddard, apparently, but uh, he's a little shit and didn't do that because he just wanted to make someone's head fall mm-hmm. off. Uh, Lord Janos has promised Harrenhal and probably like the like the worst trade ever by a Lannister. Uh, yeah, and he's having none of that. So Barristan was dismissed, and the lovely part about that is when Tyrion mentions that it wouldn't be a good idea to have Sir Barristan riding with some other man claiming that he's the king, <gasps> Cersei admits, oh, I didn't think of that because I'm an idiot, and she only ever thinks about what's right in front of her. T- <laughs> Tyrion then asks her who murdered Lord Aaron, and Cersei says she doesn't know. She does reveal that she... Uh, helped Robert to have his hunting accident with her and Lancel. Uh, and then Tyrion leaves. Let's see, Timot wanders off, and Tyrion orders Bronn to arrange quarters for the clansmen, which I'm sure everyone in the Red Keep just loves. Uh, Tyrion leaves with a Lannister escort like a boss under the command of the captain of the Queen's Guard. Uh, let's see, on the way out, he orders the heads of the Stark household taken down from the walls because that shit's just disgusting 
and the streets of King's Landing have grown restless. There's no food in the city because of the war, which does that's pretty quick, actually. I mean, I don't know. Like, I guess it's, it's a really big city that's probably relying on constant uh, food from outside, but that seems pretty quick for their... Like, maybe they didn't plan with any uh, backup stores or anything. Uh, Cersei has tripled the size of the city. Watch <laughs> amidst this famine in the Smart. city. And, yeah, I know, right? And puts uh, thousands of craftsmen to work straightening the city's defenses and also ordering the Alchemist Guild to produce 10,000 jars of wildfire because she's crazy. Uh, Lord Baelish is pro um, providing the coin to pay for all this by levying a tax on all those who entered the city. Of course, most of them come with no money, so that's working out really well. Uh, and Tyrion returns to his inn where Shay, Chella, and a large number of Black Ears are waiting for him. He's surprised to discover that Varys is there as well. And, let's see, he leaves shortly, but not before he makes it clear to Tyrion that he'll not be able to hide anything from him. So, Tyrion's game is already up before it's really even started, at least as far as Varys goes. But we all know Varys has something else going on. Um, and then there's some uncomfortable Shay shit, and that's about it. How many pumps? So, Did we talk about how many pumps it took? Did we not get the uh, pumps in this episode? Just it's got to be two or three, right? Yeah. And it's never like, more than three, right? He's like, he's like, Tyrion, Tyrion enters her halfway, oh, and it's over. It's like, what? Why do you even need to pay her? Because it's not good. And we could totally cut like, this out, but like... Oh, any sentence that starts with that, chances are we are. Yeah, yeah. Did <laughs> anyone else say racist, when, like, but... the, the clansmen came in and, like, everyone was nervous? I was like, especially Jalaba Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, oh, the clansmen. Okay, I get it now. That's, uh, that's, that's oh, really? Yeah, okay, that that's needs fine. to go out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's sorry. Fine, whatever. <laughs> Uh, oh no! For my sake, please <laughs> cut that out. Yeah, for your for your sake, I would. I would maybe. Yeah. You know. Uh, so yeah, this is this has always kind of been one of my favorite, you know, chapters, the early Tyrion chapters in this book. Um, it's actually and it's ranked pretty high on Tower of the Hand as well. But Tyrion comes in and he's kind of a boss, like he, you know, at, at least as much as he can be for a dwarf that no one respects and really no power at all before he arrives with this letter. Um, he puts Cersei in her place really fast, and you also yeah. get answers. We get answers to so many of the questions we had about, you know, um, with Bran, not with Bran, um, you know, with who killed John, John Aaron. Aaron like, I didn't, I didn't and Robert. Do that. And then you get stuff with Robert and the wine. She's like, he did it to himself. It's like, he literally drew that out for so long and we, yeah. we actually have solid answers for the first time about some of the stuff. Yeah, and she's like, fuck all, I don't know what happened with John Aaron. Come on, like, which is like, did, when you, the first time you guys read this, did you just assume she was lying? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because she, she's willing to admit to killing the to killing Robert, but that's that's gonna be like super obvious. So I don't know. No, I mean <laughs> until Lysa <laughs> Aaron gave up hers. Yeah, sorry. I'm so I think you just think that I always thought that Tyrion Canis was the, one of one of the only people that could actually get the the truth out of Cersei, like, at least it, mm. when it wasn't concerning her, like, the the prophecies around surrounding him. I mean, everything else she's more or less willing to to say to some extent. That and, of course... I guess the, that's kind of an, an interesting point. Like, we, we, we kind of realized that later on, that she doesn't really lie to Tyrion much because, because she doesn't respect him and because she doesn't think anyone is going to listen to him even if he was, you know, bold enough to say something. Yeah, that and and I think also she still uh, knows that Tyrion sees himself as a as a Lannister. Uh yeah. He just sees himself as an uh, as her ally to a certain extent, you know. They they and might have their own squabbles, but she, he would never try to like murder her or or something that well, only until when all the Merce the like Tommen and uh, Shay, until all that stuff goes down. Right. Exactly. And at this point, they're both working to get Jamie back. They're on the same side, at least on yeah. that respect. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like someone's like uh, breathing through Darth Vader or something. So they said Valencar. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> okay. 
the um the wildfire with Cersei here that's the only thing that makes me think that she might not be a Lannister. I really think that she is a Lannister, but that's like the one thing that makes me think that she might not be. It, it makes me question it a little bit. Oh, Order you mean her ordering the wildfire? Like, yeah, no, well, that like makes her... me think she's stupid. Yeah. Well, like her like she, later on in uh, I think in book 4 where like she burns the tower of the hand or whatever like she's just entranced by it and like obsessed with it and I feel like there's not that there's not that many other people that we know that was obsessed with wildfire well that he's George I think is definitely drawing parallels between Eris and Cersei at that point but he's I don't think it's necessarily has to be that oh she's a Targaryen it just means that she's losing yeah. it a little bit and she's yeah, the, yeah. it's going to her head and she's, she's losing control yeah, I hope. Yeah. I just I don't, I don't think the whole heiress as their parents is, is just like a cheap out. I don't like that. What about Tyrion? Yeah, if he... but... even mm, worse. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think but, it's I kinda, mean, you're kind of right with the whole drawing parallels, and I think it's kind of telling or kind of interesting that that she's kind of the Renera t- to uh, Ares is Magor, right? No, no, no. Renera was just connected to Magor because of her. Insanity and cruelty towards the the people in King's Landing towards oh, the I end. you're talking about like them actually being her. her I, I, was, I got my and my mixed up. Never mind. <laughs> no, no. It's, yeah, it's, 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 she she was the, the whole the whole saying Magor's teats was was a reference right. to her being Magor with teats. Right. So, so that kind of is 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 reinforced now with. Uh, Cersei kind of being Ares with teats. So should they now do a Ares with uh, Ares teats? Uh, so, no, I think she's trying to be Tywin with teats. But she's she's that's, more like okay, Tywin. okay. It, let's just like stop saying teats. Why? <laughs> so she's Ares with Te- titties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if if Cersei is drawn as a parallel to Ares. Do you think it would be very poetic if Jamie killed both of them? Valencar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that could be good. That could be good, yeah. Both of them, though? How, how, how I'd be curious to see how that would go down. I mean, he killed, he killed Ares. Ares, so he's halfway there. Oh, for oh. some reason I thought you were talking about uh, about Tyrion. Nah, he'll ride a dragon and, and do shit. I don't know. Everyone thinks Tyrion's going to be a dragon rider, but he'd have to have a weird special... Saddles. I don't know how that's gonna happen. So he can't be a dragon rider. And he just oh. spikes. Yeah, he like, just like puts his, have a he saddle. just like puts himself like he finagles himself in like the spikes of the dragon and it works out. Yeah, but like he physically couldn't fit his legs around like a dragon. I don't know. I don't know. It's not serious. But you, but I just thought of you that. Would, you would make a, he you would make a saddle. saddle. Yeah, That's you would make saying. a saddle that is fit for his legs. It, like, Who's got time like, for that? They're going to be invading the uh, cities and stuff. Or he could just like hold <laughs> on to the dragon like around like whatever is there and it's good. They're just going to reveal that, that during that boat ride, he already made it because he was All right, bored. Fine. All right, that, I didn't mean to derail us. Wait, <laughs> what you were saying? Uh, no, I was just going to say like the one note I have down for this chapter is that like Sansa and Tyria, like, Tyrion are not a bad match. As far as like, like I feel like no, they're a power couple. <laughs> like I feel like if Sansa wasn't so like annoyed about T- it being a Lannister and it being Tyrion the deformed imp, like they wouldn't they wouldn't be a bad idea. Like, they could have done great things so, together. So, so if Sansa wasn't Seer- such a ha- horrible person towards Tyrion, <laughs> that might have worked. <laughs> So it's she has good reasons to be. No, she does. She does have good reason, but I feel like if if she had thought about it a little bit more and was not like too, I mean, like I love Sansa. Like, don't get me wrong here. Like, she's one of my favorite characters, but I feel like if she may have like thought it out a little bit, like this is probably her best bet. I mean, she's just uh, she's still a hostage, and she's marrying a person that's not gonna get anything. He's he's not even a lord, really. So. How is that really a good match? He has his skills. He has a skill set, but that's essentially the only talents or only qualities he has. All all other things is just not really going for him, right? Yeah, yeah but so does Liam Neeson in those movies, and he still kicks <laughs> ass. <laughs> but it's not the same. I mean, Tyrion is not Liam Neeson. 
Yeah, but he only has a special set of skills, and he gets shit done. And, I and, want to see and that. Liam Neeson is also kind of good looking, so that that hey, Tyrion does not have that. Peter does that make Tyrion? That means Sansa's Famke Jansen. <laughs> oh my god, that'd be my nerd brain just exploded there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think we should move on. We should we should do that with a uh, with um, Reuter Tree Reuter Trees uh, as Tyrion's voice, and he's just saying, "I have a special, I, oh, I have a special set of skills, and I'll find your oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I have a special set of skittles. <laughs> Wait, he's got a special set of skittles? Skittles. I don't know. I can't Taste really. The rainbow. I have a special set of skills, sweet sister. That's probably the best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sharp vigara. Her. Harp, harp, harp. And skittles as well. Alright. <laughs> so, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, we also, in this chapter, we get the concrete statement of, um, of Cersei saying, if Sansa hadn't come to me and told me all her father's plans, and this is where oh. the thing, um, you know, really comes from, which is... Just uh, more, just... more proof that Cersei is just such a master tactician, right? I don't know who killed John and Aaron. I don't know what's going on. Oh, man, thank goodness that, that Stark girl she gave had, us the entire plot. Like, yeah, but Joffrey ruined it. it. She's also observant to know that Sansa hates her and hates Joffrey now, because she says, you know, she was wet with, wet with love, and, and that put an end to all that. <laughs> Dustin Beckemeyer on YouTube says... On the next video, can you guys go around and tell us your favorite and most hated aspects of the most important characters? Answer accordingly, please, and thank you. So, does That's anyone right. want to pick a character from these four chapters that we would like to talk about? And All right, in, in lieu of the most recent Walking Dead episode, we'll do Eeny, Meeny, Miney, Mo. My mother says, it's Patchface. Let's go with Patchface. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I, I just gotta say, I love his singing voice i mean like <laughs> patch face is just it's great and i love i hate his creepy patch face because it creeps the hell out of me <laughs> so then, uh, know, what's the difference isn't he always singing something he's like yeah under the cool. sea the fucking things oh, look like this i oh, know oh, oh, oh. i know, and, and I know. Ro Roy Trees, like doing patch face haunts my dreams it yeah does. it's, it's really good it's really Aww. good in a good way right yeah, exactly. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, in a, both, in a good both way. Be <laughs> right? You haunt my dreams in a good way. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> so yeah, Patchface. Um, thing I enjoy about him is that it kind of alludes to something more mystical uh, in the beginning of, of of the books, where it doesn't really seem like there's much mysticism in, like around them. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, things I don't like about him. Is yeah, maybe his patched face. I mean, I, I can't imagine that ever looked good, looking good. <laughs> uh, no, I, cover. that's a lot of tattoo. Yeah. Exactly, man. It must have hurt a lot. He, oh, yeah. he might have he might have gone crazy before the, uh, him him being drowned, uh, just from all the pain of him being like tattooed all over. Yeah, for sure. Like I had like a two and a half hour tattoo one time and like I got up and I was like lightheaded and woozy for like two hours if I, if it was on my face and on my head <laughs> I don't even uh, understand how that pain would have been dealt with maybe, maybe it would just drive painting. you mad maybe it would cause you to ramble well no because they already state that uh the guy's really intelligent. He can sing in like yeah. four languages or whatever. And it's just the sinking and, you know, being dead for three days that made him crazy pants. Well, that would do it. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah, allegedly. <laughs> He's just playing a long game. It's all just a farce. He's actually 100% there. <clears throat> oh, man. Yeah, being Valentin, he, he might have, have, have some uh, Valerian blood in him, right? Yeah. Oh, does so that make right? you survive underwater? Some Murish blood. Is it her blood? Oh. No, I'm just, the thing just I... saying. <laughs> Sorry? The thing, the thing I don't like about Patchface is that in hindsight, every time he comes up, I have to, like, parse out and read every single line he does and think of what it could mean instead of just reading it as it is. So <laughs> I, it makes me overthink everything. 
but uh, I, I mean, I like the fact that he's Shireen's confidant and that he gives her a measure of comfort, I guess, even though like he sings about creepy shadow things that she doesn't like and gives her nightmares. Isn't that so sad that like he's Shireen's only friend? Like, once a uh, friend, it's it's really sad, right? Yeah. He's like, Patch yeah. Face, don't do that. And he's like, ah, oh, the shadows are dancing again. It's like, okay. Yeah, you, let's face. sing that to a fucking eight-year-old. That's not creepy <laughs> at fucking all. Actually, yeah, you're right. This, this whole episode has have been much about creepy kids and their, uh, their mysterious ways. <laughs> and the lack really? of parenting. The lack of parenting, <laughs> yeah. creepy kids, and prophetic Basi- dreams. Basically how none of us understand children. <laughs> Or at least no one in the books understands children. I think it's more in the books, because, um... Because yeah. Casey apparently studies them. I mean, I have one, and I don't understand them, so... Okay. <laughs> He's gonna hear this someday, Adam. And blame I have him. no progeny, and... So oh, no. I don't know. Oh, I, mean, no. I, don't, I, don't actually I quit. Del- please delete every podcast I've ever <laughs> 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 Thank you for joining us for the, uh, episode 16. Uh, we will probably have this up in a couple months, and then Bina will have episode 19 after, or 17 after that. But thank you for joining us. My name is Greg, and thank you to Matt, Casey, Jeff, Adam, Patrick, and Tanya, who kind of has been lurking, and Jack, for 